Welcome to another episode of Tablo Theology, where we discuss trivia, truths, and theology that leads to life transformation. And today, we're here with two of, of our theology professors, Jared Chung and Dr. Louis Winkler, and they are both from the U.S. And we are discussing about resurrection. Yeah. So, Great. first, I want to ask, why is it that? Bunnies and eggs are associated with Easter. Well, I'll do the bunny. You want to talk about bunnies? Oh, yeah, I'll let uh, you tackle that one. Actually, it's <clears throat> they're not actually sure. Um, bunny is one of those things that kind of got added to Easter. Probably they speculate it's kind of shrouded in mystery. They speculate though that uh, from pagan festivals of fertility, somehow they got associated with the idea of new life, resurrection, new life, and bunnies are a symbol of a uh, of fertility because they reproduce a lot. And and so the idea was that the bunny uh, was a, uh, a symbol of new life or uh, reproduction of life. Uh, mm-hmm. But again, there's not, it's not really clear exactly how the bunny got added in to Easter, uh, except that uh, oftentimes elements like this get uh, put in that are not really Christian and come from somewhere else, and then they co-opted into the into the whole frame of the yeah, of the Easter uh, mystique or celebration. Typically, there's a process. You get you you go from being Christianized, <laughs> right, and then you get chocolatized, <laughs> right, <laughs> and 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 somewhere in between and paganized as well. But yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, yeah, for eggs. It's actually very similar, I think, for eggs. <clears throat> what I was looking up on this, I'm not an expert on these traditions. Easter traditions, I think, are Christmas traditions. You, you can trace it back. Easter traditions are sometimes just a little weird, I think. Uh, but I think it's actually very similar for eggs. So eggs are traditionally were used. They were, were for they were just seen as a sign of fertility, mm-hmm. um, especially land fertility, new life, right? Uh, which naturally fit very in fit in very well to the Easter celebration of new life and the resurrection. Right. Um, and so I think that's um, that's kind of how Easter eggs came about. And it, in the Orthodox Church, they were used that way, and they actually started painting Easter eggs. So, you know, you, you can paint, yeah. mm-hmm. dye Easter eggs. You have those traditions in some places. They started painting Easter eggs red uh, with the blood of Christ. Mm. So then you had the... Mm-hmm. So you had uh, both the Easter Sunday resurrection. You had the Good Friday, the crucifixion. Um, together and so we we at least where I'm from in the U.S. we still do the egg painting and yep. egg dyeing. We uh, still do it today. Yeah. yeah, we did that with our kids. Um, to dig deeper, why is it important for us to celebrate Easter or Resurrection? Yeah, um, yeah. Why does the church celebrate the resurrection of Christ? Mm-hmm. And um, you know, it sounds when you ask that question, it sounds kind of funny. Like it. I don't know. I so why of course we would celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Isn't that so important to our tradition as Christians? But actually, um, a lot of times when you start talking to people, I find about Easter, um, what they focus on is the crucifixion. Mm-hmm. I think we have a much better understanding of the crucifixion and what the crucifixion means uh, for our faith than we do the resurrection. And I've tested this before where I've asked people, um, what is the importance of the resurrection? And you could hear crickets chirp in the room. People that I know would understand the the importance of the crucifixion. Why the resurrection? Why is that so important? Mm. We know it's important, um, but we're not exactly sure why that is. And so um, I think my favorite verse to go to in Scripture when we look at why do we celebrate Easter and the resurrection uh, it has to be, well, it's not a passage of verses, a really long chapter, 1 Corinthians 15. Mm. Uh, where it talks about Christ conquering death. Um, But even more than Christ conquering death, um, because I think a lot of times when we think about Christ conquering death, we think about it in kind of an individual term, like our Christ conquers our death, which is one, in in a sense, true. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? Mm -hmm. Um, But what, what, what the Bible has in mind, and I think what Paul has in mind, is, a, is something that's much bigger than just the conquering of death in our individual lives. Mm-hmm. Um, this is about the undoing of the curse of sin mm-hmm. over everything, right? It's that it's that great kind of, the great undoing 
the curse is starting to become unraveled. Um, and so that's why Paul in first Corinthians 15, he calls Christ the first fruits, right? He talks about Christ. He has risen from the dead. Um, in Christ, all shall be made alive. Uh, but Christ is the first fruits. So in other words, the resurrection, what you have, um, is Christ taking our sin at the cross. He bears that curse of sin. And if you listen to the Christmas podcast, we talked about how even at Christmas, it's the start of him bearing this curse all the way through to its end point to death. That's what we celebrate, Good Friday. Um, and he that, that goes into this tomb. It is buried with Christ. The sin, the curse, all of that, he's born that. And the, what happens in the resurrection is Christ rises from the dead. None of, none of that curse is on him anymore. I mean, he rises curseless. Um, the first one, the first one to rise curseless. Um, and because of that, he is the first fruits of what is to come. So that's the first fruits of what is to come for Christians, for individuals, obviously for us with our resurrected bodies. But even bigger than that, that's the first fruits of what's to come with the world, with a new creation, a creation that was supposed to be the design mm. from the very beginning of creation that was derailed by sin. Mm -hmm. Christ being the first fruits puts that train on the track to where that's where we're heading today. And so the salvation that's involved in that resurrection, that new life, it's a new life for everything, right? And that's the beautiful picture we get in resurrection uh, sorry, in a revelation of of this new heavens and this new earth, where there is no more curse. Mm -hmm. He's he's born all of that, and res and then with his resurrected body, he bears none of it. Mm. It's done, and it's done on him. Now we obviously struggle when we fight and battle in that mm -hmm. curse today, still. Uh, but at the same time, because we can look at the first fruits, mm -hmm. we know what what the rest of the fruits going to look like. Uh, because we see Christ and we see Christ resurrected, curseless, we know we're heading in a curseless direction. Um, and so I heard a theologian, um, I was reading the other day, named Stanley Hauerwas. He's, a, he's an American ethicist, but the way he put it, I really liked it. He said it's, uh, I don't know, the resurrection is an eschatological event. That's a big word. What that means is essentially uh, it's an end times event. Mm -hmm. The resurrection is an, is God's end time event. Now, what do you mean it's the end times event, right? Because the end times haven't come yet. Uh, but what he's saying is, no, no, no. It's it's an end times event in the sense that Christ is, he's the end times. If you look at him, you know what's coming. Not just for not just for us as individuals, not just for us as humanity, but for, for creation, right? Mm -hmm. Right? For the recreation of all things. And it's and it's the resurrection is God like putting that kingdom stamp on Jesus and saying, yes, like it is, it is not only is it finished on the cross now, but it's going to be finished in the future. And you know that because you look at Jesus and you see this God, man, that's born the curse of sin as a human, he's born all of that and he's taken that all the way. And now it's gone. Uh, there's nothing left of it. And so it's this end times event where God puts his kingdom stamp on Christ and, 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 now the kingdom, that kingdom is coming, um, and it will come in full one day. And we know that because we look at Jesus. So that's, that's a, yeah. Why, why do we celebrate the resurrection? Because I mean, that's our hope, right? It's, it's, it's a season of hope and it's a season of us looking into the end times. Yeah, that's right. So you mentioned mm -hmm. about yeah, Christ resurrecting and that's yeah, the celebration and the hope that it brings, but how can we make sure that Christ being resurrected. Yeah, like I guess I, I, one of the one of the great kind of debates in our time, at least, has been this issue of the nature of the resurrection. Is it simply a uh, an event that happened in the hearts of of Jesus's followers? Is it something that mm -hmm. we just kind of hope in a kind of uh, spiritual sense? Or did the resurrection actually take place in time and space as a real historical reality? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and of course, that has been a major um, conversation that has been take, that has taken place throughout the, the, the course of, of church history. And one of the most attacked 
kinds of uh, claims that Christianity has faced uh, through time. But I think as you look at the at the uh, at the nature of the way the event is described in Scripture, mm-hmm. uh, and we could talk about the reliability of the historical documents that document this event, but the the Scriptures clearly speak of the event as not being a kind of uh, just a uh, spiritual or you know ambiguous uh, pie in the sky thing. It speaks about it as happening in real time and real space. And part of the, uh, the, the evidences that we can point to involve things like we can identify what tomb. Uh, mm-hmm. It was Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. They, when you mention a name in a document like that, people can go and have a look. Mm-hmm. And Jared mentioned 1 Corinthians 15, where it says at the beginning of that chapter, uh, when Paul is laying out, I delivered to you of first importance what I received that uh, Jesus, uh, you know, died for our sins, uh, was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And then he goes on to say, and appeared to Peter, right, and mm-hmm. to the twelve, and to more than 500 at one time. Mm-hmm. These kinds of statements, and, and then he says something very interesting most of whom are still around. In other words, if you don't believe me, you can go ask Mm -hmm. these people who actually saw Christ in the flesh, not just as a ghost or an apparition. And that's the fascinating way that he's described in terms of saying, he comes into their presence, he eats fish, for example. He says, you can touch me. You can, you know, he says to Thomas, who's a, who's who had doubted, the testimony of the apostles. You can, you can actually go ahead and put your finger in there to see that, yep, I'm real. And of course, at that point, Thomas says, "My Lord and my God." You know, he, he, and then Jesus says, "You know, blessed are you because you've seen, but, but, ble- you know, blessed are those who have not seen and believe." But we believe not because we just hope it's true, but based on the testimony of people who were actually there, people who ascribe to that event a physical reality. And the thing that you can really point to, there are many other things I could say about this, but the thing you can really point to in terms of proof of the resurrection is the transformation of the lives of those who followed him. And even you can see this even before before Christ rose from the dead, what happens to Peter when he's given a challenge to testify for Christ? He denies Christ three times. He doesn't have that kind of power. But then what happens after the resurrection and at Pentecost? Peter stands up and gives testimony. And then later in Acts, we see Peter being beaten for his faith and suffering severely. And we know later on in Peter's life, he is crucified for the, the sake of the, re, the resurrection, the claim that Jesus actually rose from the dead, that he came to this earth, suffered on the cross, died, and rose again. And he even, uh, in history, kind of church history tradition, uh, it says that he was crucified upside down because he says, I don't. I, I, I am not worthy to suffer in the same manner as my Lord. So that kind of transformation of life, and you see, and I'm just using Peter as one example of the, you know, the, 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 the transformation of the people of God after the resurrection and the, the moving of worship to a, a completely different day. There are so many things that you can point to that just say this had to have happened in real time. But the transformation of the lives of those people wasn't just something uh, kind of grounded in a hope or, or grounded in a desire. It was grounded in a real space-time event. And I think that, uh, Jared, uh, you you were talking a little bit about some of that significance, but I'd love to hear you expand a little bit more just in terms of, because we often, like you said, talk about the crucifixion and yeah. Jesus yeah. taking sin. But what does what does the resurrection do to the community of of God's people to the church? 
how 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 should that or how can that yeah yeah bring yeah that's a great question um and i think that's that goes into um being the church as a whole being a a kingdom driven people um so again the resurrection if it's god's kingdom stamp on christ that this is the king um everything that he has said about himself leading up to this point he's done um everything that needed to happen to reconcile all things to himself he has done um he is the king now um you know he's the king of um of recreation and let's say i mean he's he's god right christ also god so he's also the king of creation but now he's the king of this recreation um, but it doesn't stop there because what he's doing is he, he he's going to just, um, he he's going to ascend, but he's going to send the spirit. Uh, and what is the spirit doing? The spirit is forming the church. Mm-hmm. As we see when the spirit comes in Acts chapter two, what's his first, what's the first act of the Holy Spirit? Like form the church. Yep. That's what's going to, and so he's creating a kingdom people. And so for us as churches today, the resurrection means that we are a kingdom people um, who we have a king. I like to say it this way, um, especially coming from America, uh, coming from an American background where you have, are you a Democrat? Are you a Republican? How are you going to vote in the next election? Things like this. I say, sure. first and foremost, I am an absolute monarchist. Yep. Um, and we have to view ourselves that way. We are absolute monarchists. Um, we serve a king. Um, and it's a king, and he's a king who is, um, he is king, and he's going to be shown to be king um, over all the kingdoms of the world. And um, and so as Christians, uh, as churches, what do we, we have to view ourselves in that light. So we have to view ourselves in that light as a people that, that demands a certain ethic of the way that we live. Um, because we are a part of this great resurrected people, we, we live in a certain way. Uh, but also in our in our view to the world and, and the way that we look at the world mm-hmm. around us, we're 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 kingdom ambassadors. The church itself is not the kingdom of God, right? The kingdom of God's bigger than the church, but we do manifest the kingdom of God almost like an embassy in the world. And so we're kingdom ambassadors as a people. And so as we live this ethic out, um, as as we as we witness to the resurrection in our works and our words to others. Um, we've got to find our identity in that. We are, um, we're of the risen King. We are people of the risen King. And so that it defines, it just gives identity to who we are as a church. And by the way, that kingdom is not, um, it has been inaugurated. It has not been finalized yet as it's going to be, um, to where, um, yeah, to where things on, are on earth as they are in heaven, right? right? That has not happened yet. And what that means is that there's work. We're a kingdom people that are put on a mission. So we don't just we don't just exist as a people for the sake of each other. We exist as a people for the sake of the expansion of the kingdom. Um, and the way that God has designed it is that he sends the Holy Spirit into the world through the church to expand people through the church. Mm-hmm. As broken as we are as churches, uh, I always like to say, if you think you're in a perfect church, you're in a really bad place and you need to <laughs> dig in a little bit deeper because you're going to find it's not perfect. So as broken as we are as sinners uh, and, and churches that are full of these reconciled sinners that a lot of times don't know how to reconcile and um, and brokenness and everything that happens within the church. At the same time, God looks on us as a king, as his kingdom people. And that's how he is designed in his uh, in his providence. He's designed that he is going to expand his kingdom on earth via the church. And so we're not just the kingdom people for ourselves, but we're also a kingdom people on mission. And the resurrection puts us on that mission. Um, and so the resurrection, in that sense, is it's it's inseparable from from the mission of God, from what God's doing in the world. Um, I like to say it this way: it's not a, it's not a question of whether we're in the office, we're going into the office or not. Uh, the question is, we're we're already in the office. God's put us in. He's He's made His kingdom ambassadors. Are Are you doing your work, or are you uh, looking at YouTube, yeah. or doing something else you're supposed to be doing? I mean, that's that's the situation that we're in. Is God's kingdom people today, yep. and so we're a kingdom people, a kingdom pe- people on mission uh, in the world as kingdom ambassadors. And then I think uh, at the same time, we're also a people of hope. 
The resurrection uh, tells us as the church that we are people of hope. Um, and so as churches, we're supposed to be communities of hope, mm-hmm. communities of hope in a world that needs hope, uh, communities of of hope uh, among each other to encourage each other when we're in need of hope. Yep. And it's because that res- because the resurrection ultimately is an end times event that happened in this world. Mm-hmm. It's like the end times happened already, in a sense, in this world, in Christ. And because of that, we've got this incredible hope that that's the first fruits are going to bear full fruit. That's right. Um, and we've got this incredible end times hope that, uh, yeah, that's what's coming. That's our way. Um, so, so, so we live that way. We live that way to the world. We're able to endure suffering for the name because we're a people of hope. Yeah. Uh, we're, in a, we're able to endure persecution for the name because we're a people of hope. And I just think about that too, as Easter approaches, um, you know, as you celebrate Easter, I think it helps to think about not just your church, not even the churches maybe like within Singapore, but just think of the churches around the world. We are all celebrating the resurrection of Christ mm-hmm. on this same Sunday. And uh, think about the churches that are celebrating under persecution yeah. mm-hmm. and um, still celebrating the resurrection because there are people of hope. Uh, um and that's who we're to be. We're always to be this people of hope um, because of the resurrection. Yeah. yeah, and I think that hope, again, as we talked about, it's not just grounded in a in some sort of a dream or some sort of uh, kind of vague uh, notion of what we hope it will be. It is grounded in the reality that hope has come. Yes, yeah. That it is drawn from the eschatological, to use that fancy word, mm-hmm. drawn from the reality of what is coming through what has come in Christ. And in in that space-time event, there is hope that is grounded in a reality that comes from beyond this world. Mm-hmm. And so that kind of hope isn't just a, you know, wishful thinking. That is a hope that is real. Mm-hmm. That is a hope that draws us to the future and draws us into a reality that we can only imagine mm-hmm. and then and then not even the it yeah it's 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 it it pulls us out of the tragedy the suffering the struggles of our time yeah and and moves us to what will be yeah and brings about in our time and in our suffering and in our tragedy what will be mm-hmm. in the here and now. Mm-hmm. I think about um, the, I think about the plagues that were happening around the time of the early church and what a sign it was that everybody else was fleeing the city. Anybody that could get out of Rome yep. is fleeing Rome. Only the Christians are staying behind to help. Um, and and what a sign that is of the people of hope, right? That That it's like, yeah, that I mean, it just shows. No, there's something. Something is real. <laughs> right. There's something that is more real than um, that itself. And so when everybody itself. else, yeah, yes. than death itself. When everybody else is going, ah, you know, we can say we're in it. We're we will, we can stay with the hurting. Yep. We can stay with the broken. Uh, we can stay with the fearful through the midst of that because what is coming is more real. Um, and and that's um yeah that's just I think what you were saying I mean it's just a beautiful picture you know what what does this mean for us just as I, we're in a world today where a lot of people are just freaking out about world events yeah um and I think as a church we have to be a place where we can analyze those events we can think through those events but we're going to think differently about those events maybe than what our social media feeds would suggest right hmm. uh maybe than what uh what news media might suggest we're going to be thinking differently about that because we we're thinking about it through a different reality yep mm-hmm. um and from a fundamentally different identity too this is why paul talks about the fact that we have not just been buried with christ but we have been raised mm-hmm. with him and so we are literally spiritually literally raised to new life in christ and so that gives us a fundamentally new nature a fundamentally new identity uh that that uh, that brings us into the kingdom mm-hmm. and and shows us uh who we are and who we should emulate mm-hmm. in the world 
So you mentioned about hope and church mission, but in reality, a lot of churches are suffering, a lot of Christians are suffering, and sometimes it's easier to dwell on suffering in a state of suffering than to to be reminded or to cling on to the hope that the resurrection brings. So how can we practically be reminded of the the resurrection or the hope sure. that it brings? I would suggest if you uh, if you're an individual Christian that's involved in some form of suffering, I think the wrong the, the wrong way to answer that question would just to kind of be to white knuckle grip onto resurrection and hope and try to ride it out in some way. I don't think that's what God intends at all. Uh, first off, God doesn't intend for us to ride out those moments of suffering um by ourselves yeah mm. that's just never that, that, that's that's not at all what's intended yeah. we're not we're not stoics um we're we're christians uh and because of that what that means is when you're in that situation if you're trying to do that by yourself i would go so far to say is you're going to find it very very difficult to hold on to resurrection hope in those times um rather i would rec- i would i would suggest that maybe what god's doing is pushing you in a place where you have to go to others who can be that beacon of hope for you. Um, and that comes in the church. That's why we need each other. That's why the faith is not just my faith, it's our faith that we that we are meant to live out together. Um, and so, yeah, I think um, when you cannot feel the hope of the resurrection, that doesn't mean it's not there. But it might mean that God's calling you to go to people who can do that for you and to bear that burden for you and to bring that hope about. Um, yeah, I mean, I, just this morning I was um, asking for some prayer over over some things with a men's group I'm in, and uh, right away one of the guys in the men's group just sends a sends a passage to me a scripture or sends it to the group on WhatsApp, and it was like, that's exactly what I needed. Mm-hmm. But he just he nailed it. You know, he didn't know. But he just, it was the way the spirit was working through the body in that way. I, I was in a situation where I couldn't really think straight. I couldn't be in a, in a situation where I could find the peace I was looking for, resurrection, hope that I was looking for. And yet, uh, just through this brother sending me this verse and saying, hey, I'm praying for you right now. And uh, the spirit just put this verse on my heart and, and sent it. And it was like, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't even an obvious, like Romans 8, 20, 28 or so. It was nothing like that. You know, it was like very clearly the spirit had put this on his heart um, mm-hmm. as if he knew exactly what I was feeling at that moment, even though he didn't, you know, the Holy Spirit did. Yeah. And it's in moments like that where I think um, we go. Yeah. So uh, you're not called, you know, when we as individuals and we're facing suffering in our life, you're not called to walk through that alone. That's not what God intends at all. As churches on the whole, that means there uh, there's a necessary duty of churches to be burden bearers for other people yeah. to where that hope is there. The hope is the hope is a lot more likely to be found in the community as a whole than it is in the individual. Yeah. Um, and so we 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 bear that hope for each other. Uh, we encourage each other with that hope. We bear those burdens for each other. So I would say. Don't try to look inside yourself to find that. Um, that can be very difficult, and, and particularly in really difficult situations of suffering that, that people uh, go through in life. Yeah. Uh, look, look to the church for that. Look to the community. And as churches, we have to be that for each other um, because Lewis's struggle might not be my struggle. So I can, I'm in a place where I can actually speak into Lewis's struggle in a way that he can't speak into it himself, and he can speak into my struggle the way that I can't speak into it myself. And so, um, yeah, yeah, that's what, I guess that's how I would answer that question. Go to the community of hope. Go to the, go to the kingdom people. Um, that's what that's what it exists for. Because, again, we, we live in a society that's looking to all kinds of other places for hope and mm-hmm. uh, for security and for, you know, uh, therapeutic solutions uh, to the tragedies and and struggles that we face and that should be, that we need to be a different kind of people we need to look first and foremost to the lord and his people uh, to uh, to find real help mm-hmm. in time of lead i also realized that you know 
as Filipinos, we celebrate Christmas for months. Yes. For months. Yes. But I realized that we need to celebrate resurrection as much as we celebrate Christmas or even probably more because mm. it's really hope that the world moves. Yeah, and, that's right. And mm-hmm. and actually, it was Easter that was celebrated long before Christmas. Oh, I think Christmas was a much Another... later addition to the liturgical calendar, mm-hmm. uh, and only after several hundred years. Of, yeah. So actually, Easter has always been the primary mm-hmm. celebration of the church. Yeah, and then the the podcast we did on Christmas a couple months ago, I think we mm-hmm. talked about how even the dating of Christmas is related to Easter. Yes. Mm-hmm. Easter was already dated. That's right in the calendar and celebrated at that time. Um, because, I mean, that was the proclamation, you know, Christ resurrected. Yeah. If Christ does not resurrect, then everything that happens before that because it has no significance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It just falls apart. The whole story falls apart. That's right. And so, yeah, there, it, that story really does hinge on, on the resurrection mm-hmm. is why it's celebrated. And it's what you go to Acts, that's what they're proclaiming. Yeah, that's right. And they, they proclaim that's the right. resurrection. That's right. So for my last question, what is your one taba for today from today's discussion? Yeah, I, I like uh, Jared's point, and it and it's uh, just a good reminder, especially because coming from an individualistic society where we tend to think about the resurrection in individualistic terms, and tend to uh, try to struggle through or make you know uh, face realities of life's difficulties alone. Uh, and I really appreciate the fact that when God calls us into uh, the church, he calls us to a community, a kingdom community of a certain kind of people that are, you know, intending, uh, intended to reflect the reality of the resurrection in their ethics, in their hope, in their mm-hmm. attitudes towards one another, in their in their submission to the kingship and lordship of Christ. So I really like that emphasis on the uh, the communal aspect of what we are called into uh, and the reality that the resurrection constitutes a new people, a kingdom people that, bro- that brings the end of the age into the present. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think for me, like I said, I just read... I don't know, just the, the thought hit me as I was reading this the other day that how the resurrection really is this kind of end times event. Mm-hmm. That's just stuck with me. And even as we've kind of had this conversation here, I just realized, well, I'm like, Jesus is literally a picture of of the end times. Mm-hmm. It's already happened. Yeah. Um, and we can say we're living in the end times, not because we're predicting dates or anything like, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> based on events. Mm-hmm. No, we can say we're living in the end times because the end times... It started, it's happened, and it's happened in Christ. And I don't know, it just hit me in a new way as I was, even as I was just presenting and talking about that. Um, we have a picture of the end times and how much more secure yeah. ought that to make mm-hmm. us in what that ending is going to be and uh, just how amazing is it that that ending comes. So I guess, yeah, taking that away and I might order some uh, chocolate chocolate bunnies for takeaway when I get out of here too. <laughs> Very hot. And that's, yeah, but it's so true that confidence comes. Mm-hmm. It's so funny that, you, you know, bunnies do not play eggs, but no, no, they're yeah. united. They're yeah. united Easter. in every Easter. <laughs> yeah. But that's not my tamo. But honestly, I, I learned a lot um, from the, today's discussion. But one, uh, one striking was you know, Christ resurrected, but that's not the end, that there's still kingdom work yet, and we are part of it. So we have to make communities that are celebrate hope. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we need to, as we know that there are so many churches that are suffering, we should, you know, uh, be vessels of hope for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening and see you again for our next episode of Tabal Theology. Bye!